I want to talk about humor. You do? I'm not quite sure how to start on it. It's a reflex with you. Your satirical instinct is a reflex in Dawn, it seems to me. Irrepressible. It's the only weapon I have. I've Someone said, you don't have a face for comedy, you've got a face for tragedy. <laughs> That's what he said. And then you've made us laugh for, laugh for 50 years about this man. Well, a lot of comedians have sad faces, you know. And in a way, all your comedy is totally serious. All good comedy is serious. It's about something. What's it about? It's about what itches you, what's bothering you. Woody Allen said all comedy is based on fear. <laughs> and, and Mel Brooks says that uh, music is created by fear. A lion is eating my foot off. <laughs> <laughs> Was it Charles Ludlam who said, if you're going to tell people the truth, you better make them laugh at the same time, otherwise they'll kill you. That's my theory. It's interesting because when I did Morningside for five years, I would occasionally lapse into Charlie, not meaning to. I'd say Premier Trudeau, I mean Prime Minister Trudeau. <laughs> and, but then I would try and do one of Charlie's remarks about politics. I would get hate mail. Charlie never got a hate mail. Right. You need a mask. And the mask frees you from that kind of responsibility, or the mask... Because it's somebody else talking, you see. And why can't I hate Charlie if you make some political remarks as Charlie? Why can't I hate Charlie, or, or, or then if you know. make the same remark as yeah, Don? I suppose you're allowed to, but nobody ever has. But they've been very rough on Don Harron. It's like the mean clown. I'm fascinated by the mean clown. I love watching the mean clown. Though if the mean clown was a human being, I probably wouldn't tolerate their malevolence. But the mean clown but is it, a human being. But it is a human being. And yet I enjoy watching the malevolence work its way out. Why? Well, clowns are pretty mean people, you know, I mean, what they do. In terms well, of? If you go over to Cirque du Soleil, they're always doing terrible things to innocent people, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, the, a joke is a, is a banana peel. For the other person who doesn't, hopefully. Yeah. Mm. So is it the truth that is mean in a clown? No, truth is never mean. The means of getting at it may be. Truth will set you free. And you laugh when you know, or you laugh when you see. Yeah. That's what a laugh is. is. You tell a joke. When I get it, I laugh. That's I the see release. It. That's, the re that's the lessening of tension. And if I don't get it, if I remain in ignorance, I remain silent and feel and, left and out. Tense. Yeah. You feel left out if you don't get it. So was telling the joke the same as uh, Cirque du Soleil clown stealing the purse or me pulling out the chair or the mm -hmm. banana peel? Yeah. And we do it, that politicians love it. You can do anything to them and they love it because you're talking about them. They're much more tolerant than the average population. But if you, Don, went to a politician and said the same kind of truth and, you know, trying to bring them to account, mm -hmm. they would not take it as easily as if you, Well, for Charlie example, said the that. hardest one to make laugh I ever met was Pierre Trudeau. And I did a dinner and he was there and I did uh, political jokes and he never reacted. So I decided to insult him. And I said, the wife, uh, it was one of uh, your Trudeau maniacs, you know, back in, 68, when you came to our town, 
Pari sound, and yeah, yeah. You had your bare feet and your scandals and your ass caught around your neck, and then you took off all your clothes and you jumped into the Kaiwena's pool, and and uh, uh, you done a backflip, and all the women went straight to the Valiant box and did the same thing for you. Well, that was sixty-eight. Now this is seventy-two. And, and the wife, she's not so sure that she's going to uh, exercise her French fries for you this time because you're the one that said that the, the government cannot do its business in the middle of your bedroom, and that's all right. She says, that's... But then you said, I, um, why don't we let the homosexuals have free abortions? And he fell off his chair. He did, did he? <laughs> yes. Was it a, an... Anglo-Saxon kind of humor that he couldn't get, that he finally got? No, I don't know. He was just being above it, you know. He was being cool. But only by getting to him, by making fun of him. Right. And he was a one of them. He laughed and he was, yeah. Right. Because senses of humor change with cultures, do they not? Yeah. The great one, of course, was Robert Stanfield. We did a, a, a roast of Robert Stanfield. All the comics gathered in Halifax, and we all made fun of him the way he spoke, because we all loved him. He was the greatest prime minister we never had. And he, at the end of the evening, he had to give the rebuttal to all of us. And he did it with one line. He said, uh, "This evening has been a complete failure." You cannot roast a wet blanket. <laughs> wow. Yeah. There's something humane in a laugh, is there not? There's something revealing of humanity. It's also something of the personal ad ad advertising. They love to... It's about him. Yeah. You know? I mean, all politicians are like actors. They want to know about that the, uh, the public is adoring them or is or is, is listening, or is caring about them, or is concerned. And you have stayed more in comedy. You started off as a tragic actor, as in, in, in the films, and in Merchant of Venice, and now you've left that. I played a comedy part in Merchant of Venice. Right. Bassanio, as Guthrie said, I said, why are you doing this play? Six million people died, for God's sake, because they were Jewish. He said, you wait. This will be an anti-Gentile play. This is back 1955 in Stratford. And again, I could say that to him. Why are you doing it? And, and he said, you're going to play Lorenzo. No, I don't want to play Lorenzo. I'd rather play Bassanio. He says, good. Because in my play, Bassanio is bisexual. He's having an affair with Antonio, but he needs money, so he's going to woo this girl. Says, and, and they're just the, the, the yacht club. RCYC bunch who don't have to worry about making a living. Sherlock is the only one who has to make a living. And when Portia uh, says he has to pay with a, with a pound of his own flesh, we threw everything at him in the courtroom like Nuremberg inkwells. And he left. And, and I said, Guthrie, you did it. He wow. made the Gentiles look like Nazis. Yeah. Pauline. Yeah. There, there is, again, going back to the, um, the group of actors at the radio who were actually sort of the beginning of the Canadian, of a Canadian mm -hmm. company. It's the stage series. In comedy, in humor, that has been very strong in this country, and you being a main, one of the main lines of it. If you look at all the I comedy had troops and like satirical Tom Tweed and uh, uh, Eric Nickel, I worked with Eric Nickel in, on a show in England with two Englishmen, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton. Have you ever heard of them? Mm -hmm. Big tall guys did a show called My Word. They ad libbed sort of uh, cliches, and they would do puns on well-known uh, sayings and things. That's, what, that, that's where I, I did my apprenticeship. And, uh, and I learned. From learned what? Learned timing? How to, how to shape a script. 
Tommy Tweed said, always be faithful to your author if you're going to adapt anything. And I was aware of this all through ad ad adapting Anne of Green Gables, which is in its 44th season, because I was faithful to her, Lucy Maud Montgomery. I want to go to Anne of Green Gables in a second, but yeah. is there something, I know there isn't something called Canadian humor, but is there a, a sort of a common point of view, because so many Canadian humorists and satirists have, have flourished in this country and then gone to the United States or had a career like you. Well, I'm an old guy now. I mean, I see young guys coming up who are very different. And I mean, Bob and Ray were sort of illegitimate sons of mine, but they're very different in their approach and wonderful. And I see uh, uh, Sean Majumdar, who's an East Indian Newfoundlander, and I, I, I think that it, all kinds of new colors are coming up, fresh. But the uh, SCTV gang and the kids in the hall. Yeah. And the, but they all go south. Is there something that in our character that lends itself to satire? Yeah, it's because Canadians have a referee position. We are not in the action, so we can comment and stand outside, which is what a comic does. Right. And that's why we're so successful down there. Also, we are successful because we've done everything. You had to, if you're a Canadian, you, you, you've got to know how to do more strings in your bow than, than an American who can concentrate on one thing. No. That's why we're lucky. That's why we we're versatile. A lot of kids who go down there have produced, directed, written, as well as performed. Right. Do you think it's necessary for a comedian to be able to write their own material? I think it saves your ulcers. I mean, you have to worry about whether the guy is going to come up with the right stuff for you. When I stink, I know who did it. <laughs> and is that hard to take when you stink? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, why wouldn't? Well, I just think someone of your reputation and your, you know, your strength and longevity in performing comedy to... Well, you don't stink all the time, but they, you, you have something you hope they get, and they don't. And you think, what did I do wrong? Right. Sometimes you think, what did they do wrong? You know. But, right. Uh,